What I want to share with you tonight as you turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 8 uh, is something that I shared actually on Sunday in our PM Bible study mm -hmm. under the title Life in the Spirit. I'm titling this Walking in the Spirit. And folks, I want to tell you, I just want to drill down deeper in this subject because this is the crux of the Christian life. I wish that I knew this stuff when I was a young Christian and a young pastor. I could have helped people as well as myself a lot more than I was able to then. And so this is so vital. This truth is so vital that it bears us looking again at it, even though we looked at it on Sunday afternoon and looking at it uh, in a more condensed fashion. And maybe, you know, they say that uh, repetition aids learning. So maybe when we hear it again, uh, we get a better grip on it and a better understanding. The only reason being that if we understand it, then we can apply it. <laughs> we can utilize it in our life. Because I want you to understand this too. The spirit-filled life, the Christ life, I'm using all these synonyms, the victorious Christian life, the higher life, it's been called by a whole bunch of names, it's the same thing. The spirit-filled life is available and it is possible for every single believer. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved, it doesn't matter how good a Christian life you've lived or how bad a Christian life you've lived up to this point. The spirit-filled life is for you if you're a believer. It's God's intention. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Let this sink in. There is therefore no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I'm just going to stop there a moment. There is no condemnation. What's he talking about? You realize that before the Bible, uh, when it was originally written, there was no chapter divisions. There was no verse numbers. It just was all one document. That helps you to understand how important the context is. What he just said in our, in our Bible, it's just a couple of verses up is, Oh, wretched man that I am, 724. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 1 of chapter 8, that's why he says there is therefore now no condemnation. Praise the Lord, we're not stuck in that place of being a wretched man defeated until the future when Jesus comes for us and glorifies us. No, we're delivered from that kind of defeat, that kind of condemnation right now. Notice it, there is therefore now no condemnation. How is that possible? Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free, has liberated me, has delivered me from the law of sin and death. Well, how did he do that? Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. That doesn't mean that God's law is deficient. What it means is that the law of God could not deliver us from sin because of the weakness, the fallenness of our human flesh. So what did God do? What a great plan. Look at verse 3 again. He sent his own son in human flesh. 
He sent his own son in a human body. And he sent his own son in a human body for sin. And in doing so, he condemned sin in our flesh, in the human body. Remember when he died? He not only died for sin, but he died to sin. Those prepositions are very important. He died to sin. Well, what did he do? Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What we are taught in verses 2 and 3 in particular is that there is we're not condemned to be stuck in that place of wretched man defeat because the Spirit of God who indwells every single believer can counteract and can overcome the law of sin and condemn it instead of us in our bodies, in our flesh. Now, see the word flesh, it keeps popping up there in this the first uh, part of this eighth chapter. It, it just keeps repeating flesh, flesh, flesh. Let me just define for you real quick the use of flesh in the Bible. Sometimes flesh in the Bible is just another name for your body, okay? Your body is made of flesh. This is flesh, right? Okay? But also in the Bible, it depends on the context, and it's used here like this. Sometimes the flesh is the turf where sin operates on. Like, you know, a football field is the turf that a football team plays on. Well, the flesh in the Bible sometimes is the place where sin operates, where indwelling sin in us operates. And so it refers to not just your body, but your soul. Did you know that sin doesn't operate in your spirit? You're a, you're a tripartite person. You have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Your soul is where God dwells. That's where you have become a partaker of the divine nature in your, I, did I say soul? I meant your spirit. I'm sorry. Let me correct that quickly. Your spirit is where God, the Holy Spirit dwells. And so that's totally saved. There's no sin there, but there's sin in, in my soul. There's sin in my soul, which is my thinking, my deciding, choosing, and, and uh, my affections, the things that I desire, the things that I aspire for, the things that I, uh, my emotions, all of that is part of it. That's my soul life. And that's, there's sin there. And obviously there's sin in my body too, because I, the sin that resides in my soul is carried out through my body. Sometimes it's words that are wrong or a wrong tone in my words, you know? Sometimes it's things that I look at that I shouldn't look at. So sin, our flesh, it's it can refer just to the human body, but it also, in this scripture, also refers to the turf where sin carries out its, its work in our soul and in our body. Does that make sense to you? Okay, you and you can determine what the definition of flesh is when you look at the context. Okay, so I just wanted you to know that. But here's the here's the bottom line. It's impossible. It's impo absolutely impossible to live the Christian life without God working in you without putting into operation what we're taught here 
in this passage that I'm going to share with you in a moment. I, I, I want to focus in on verse 9, 10, and 11 tonight because there are there's a three-step progression here that is all about walking in the Spirit. By the way, when I say walking in the Spirit, that's the same thing as being Spirit-filled. Okay? A Spirit-filled Christian is a Christian that walks in the Spirit. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? A three-step progression. I'm going to give you three words that describe it. Three words that describe walking in the Spirit. Are you ready? You might want to write these down, and then I'll, I'll expand on each one a little bit. The first one is dependence. That's verse 9. Verse 9 is about dependence. You can't walk in the Spirit without dependence, of course, upon the Holy Spirit. The second word is competence, and that's verse 10. And competence has to do with not my competence, but when you exercise dependence on the Lord, then you find his competence is sufficient. And then the third word is the word experience, and that's verse 11. And that means that when you have dependence, you will experience the Holy Spirit's competence in your life. So dependence, competence, and experience. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I want to just expand on those a little bit and make it practical and helpful. And that's our prayer, Lord. That's our prayer. Uh, if we don't understand, we can't apply. But Lord, if we understand and don't apply, then we've really deceived ourselves. Because it's not the hearing, and it's not the mere understanding, but it's what we do with what we know that really is important. And so I pray that perhaps as a result of our uh, brief uh, thoughts here tonight, that well, we won't have any excuses for not understanding the Spirit-filled life, what it means to walk in the Spirit. Lord, help us to make it as clear, as uh, pointed, and powerful as only you can do. We can't. You can. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about verse 9. I'm going to read it. But you're not in the flesh. That is, you are not living on that level. That's not what you are about if you're a believer. That's not who you are. But you're in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. And he is. Now, second sentence in verse 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I said the first step in walking in the Spirit, what does it take to walk in the Spirit? It takes dependence. That's what verse 9 is about. It takes faith. You know what walking is? Have, think about it. What is walking? Our little little guys, our little toddlers, they have to learn how to walk. They first crawl, and then they, they learn to walk. And walking, if you analyze it, is, is just simply taking one step after another, step at a time. Walking in the Spirit is a step-by-step -step activity that we, we need to learn. And we learn by dependence. You know, if you have a little toddler that's just learning to walk, I doubt whether you would uh, say, hey, go over to the pharmacy over there and uh, get me a quart of milk. You would take them by the hand you wouldn't let them cross Voorhees Avenue by themselves. This is what walking in the Spirit is. It's like a father taking a little child by the hand 
holding that child's hand and and stepping and that child stepping in sync with dad to cross a busy street. So dependence, so walking in the spirit is learning to walk as a, as a little child holds his daddy's hand crossing a busy street. It's depending upon the Holy Spirit to lead you, okay, to lead you so you know what to do, where to go. You need his wisdom. You, you depend upon the Holy Spirit to lead you, but then you also, in conjunction with that, you need more than the Holy Spirit to lead you. You need him to give you the ability to do whatever he's leading you to do. Okay? That's the dependence part. Now, I want you to look at the second sentence in this uh, ninth verse because it's confusing. And I think it's misunderstood. It has been misunderstood, I think, by myself for a long time. It says, now, if any man or any believer, really, has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I want you to see the word have in that ninth verse, H-A-V-E. It's a word that means to take, to receive. And in the context, he's not talking about taking or receiving the Spirit of God for salvation. The first five chapters of Romans was about salvation by faith or justification. Chapters 6, 7, and 8 are not about salvation justification, but salvation sanctification separation to God, holy living. Okay, so what he's saying in that sentence is not taking the Holy Spirit as your Savior, but taking the Holy Spirit here as your leader, as the one that empowers you. If you're not taking if you're not having, if you're not receiving the Spirit's enablement, his power, then you are not being his surrendered follower. That's what he's saying. You're not being his surrendered follower because you're not yielding to the Spirit's lordship. And where he's Lord, there's liberty, right? That's what the scripture says. So it's not about the Holy Spirit's indwelling us for salvation, but it's about the Holy Spirit's enabling us for sanctification. In fact, that word have is in the present tense, which means it's not something you do one time and then it's over. It's an ongoing necessity that we keep depending upon him. We keep taking, we keep receiving him. You don't get saved over and over and over again. It's a one-time deal. This is not that. The emphasis in the context is not possessing the person of the Holy Spirit. He says he indwells all believers. In the context, it's all about having the Holy Spirit's power in your life, okay? And that requires dependence. That's the first of three progressive steps in walking in the Spirit, dependence. The second step is verse 10, I've said, and that's competence. He says, and if Christ be in you, is Christ in you? If you're a believer, Christ is in you, right? Really, it's, but since, you know, since Christ is in you. He says, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Let me unpack that a little bit for you. What he's saying here is, since Christ is in you, though your body is still connected to indwelling sin, what is, you're dead, that is, you're separated from the life of God, you're under the curse indwelling sin is, 
when you yield to the Holy Spirit, something wonderful happens. You get his competence. You access his life. And his righteousness flows through you. It's always the Holy Spirit is competent, not me. It's always his competence, never yours. So when in surrender, you take the provision of the Holy Spirit, you then access God's competence. Call it grace, if you will. It's his supernatural enablement, his ability that he gives you to obey the will of God in exchange of your inability to obey. You know, if I didn't have the Holy Spirit of God working in me, I'd never obey the will of God. The thing that uh, that uh, is responsible for me as a believer obeying God's will is, number one, the Spirit of God gives me a desire to. If I didn't have him, I wouldn't even want to. You have a bunch of people on this earth, they have no desire to obey the will of God. They don't even think about it. But when you get the Spirit of God in you, he gives you a desire to want to obey, and thankfully he doesn't just leave it on that level, but he also couples that with the ability to do it, what he gives you a desire for. He gives you the competence. It's his competence. And that's what verse 10 is all about. Because Christ is in you, though your body uh, is uh, is connected with that uh, with uh, indwelling sin, indwelling sin is still in your body, not in your spirit, but it's still in your body. You're not joined to it in your spirit like you, you were before salvation. That's different but it still resides in your body and in your soul, and it brings that separation from the life of God. However, the Holy Spirit of God can overcome that, that deadness. He's competent. He's able. Again, I repeat, it's always the Spirit's competence, never yours. Okay? Third step in this progression of walking in the spirit, dependence, competence, and verse 11 is experience. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, well, he does. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken it, that make alive or even revive shall quicken or, or revive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Here is the promise in verse 11. The promise is that the life of Christ in you can be experienced. You can experience the, the, the promised life of Christ imparted to you. He will impart his supernatural life in you and through you. That's what verse 11 is about. For uh, many, many years, I thought that verse 11 was talking about a future resurrection of my body. But in the context, it's not about that future glorified body. It's not what he's talking about. In the context, he's talking about resurrection power in your human body. Resurrection power to obey the will of God. That supernatural enablement brought into your mortal body by the Holy Spirit of God living in you and living the life of Christ through you. It's not a reference to your future bodily resurrection, but experiencing his life in you, overcoming the deadly effects of of the flesh that is sin in your body and your soul through the Holy Spirit himself counteracting and overcoming indwelling sin in us, in our soul, in our body. It's spirit-filled living. It's walking in the spirit. I'm going to close with this illustration. Walking in the spirit is like this. Well, let me tell you first what it's not like. Think about being in a car, and uh, and you're driving the car, 
and the Holy Spirit is sitting in the passenger side. That's really what the Spirit-filled life is about. It's not the Holy Spirit sitting at the wheel and driving the car. It's you driving the car, but the Holy Spirit, your chauffeuring deity, if you will, you're chauffeuring God around, and you're listening to him, and he says, okay, go, stop, turn right, turn left. You're doing the driving. You're following his leading. But here's, here's another thing. He's not only the one guiding you as you drive, but he's the engine of the car too. He's making it go. He's getting you. He's telling you where to go, and then he's getting you there. He's giving you the power to get there. So that's how I understand. You simply obey his commands. And you trust him to give you the ability to carry out what he tells you to do. When he tells you to stop, when he tells you to go, when he tells you to turn here or back up, whatever. You know what I mean? It's just completely relying upon him and his power to get to you, to get you where he's leading you and what he wants from you. 